It's time for your daily LSU baseball update with Musso at the box. Now, Matt Musso. And welcome in to another edition of Musso at the box. Top 10 matchup for LSU and Florida this weekend. And today we get to preview it. Man, let me tell you, if this one doesn't get your blood going, if this one doesn't get you fired up, not much Will, any time, any time LSU and Florida tangle in anything, it's always, always a good time. It can always get a little chippy, always get a little fiery. Add in the fact that the last time these two teams met was the College World Series Finals last June when Florida had their pitching lined up and LSU took national championship number seven home. Add in the fact that this is Florida's first trip to Baton Rouge since 2019. It's been almost five years since Florida has made the trek west here to BR. And, I mean, you have all the makings for a great weekend. Um, The downside is the weather Friday night might suck. But we'll see. We'll get to that. So hold out hope. Pack the box. This should be a great Great weekend with a lot of eyes nationally on Baton Rouge as well as LSU looks to bounce back. And today, we're going to preview the series, tell you how LSU can bounce back, give you the lowdown on Florida. We're going to go through it all, and I could not be more fired up to do just that that so hit the like button smash the like button as a matter of fact get subscribed up to the youtube channel if you have not already subscribe up on your favorite podcast app all of that greatly greatly appreciated and let's get right to it you have number six florida coming in at 12 and 8 2 and 1 in the southeastern conference facing number four lsu 18 and 4 1 and 2 in sec play continuing with your overview lsu leads the all-time series versus the gators 68 53 and one of course as we said the last meeting was the college world series finals in omaha in june 2023 won by your fighting tigers of lsu florida i'm gonna say this right off the top and i want everybody to hear me yes they're 12 and 8 no that doesn't look good this is a very 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 formidable opponent They are one of the most talented teams in the country. They are starting to pitch it a little bit better in the bullpen. The starting pitching is still on on edge for Florida a little bit, but my goodness, can they swing it. We're going to spend a lot of time on the offense for the Gators and the defense, excuse me, and the pitching staff and the defense actually as well because they're really good. But don't get... Don't get bogged down in that 12-8 and record. This team has not lost a weekend yet. I'm not counting the one game they got to play against St. John's opening weekend. That does not count. Yes, they lost, but the other two games were canceled. We're not counting that as a full weekend. So when they've been able to play a full weekend, they have not lost one yet. So, yeah, even though they're four games above 500, even though the pitching's falling apart, they have found a way to win every single weekend that they've played. So this is going to be one heck of a challenge for LSU uh, as they try to bounce back from a certainly lackluster weekend against the Mississippi State Bulldogs. Let's get right into our pitching matchups. That's where we will start every week. That's where we will start right here today. For LSU, junior righty Luke Holman goes to the bump on Friday night. You are looking at start number six, appearance number six for Holman, four and one on the year with an ERA of 0.63. 28 and two thirds innings for Holman. He has walked just five and struck out 43. The opponent hits 176 against Holman. Here's what you want to see. It's going to be the same thing for every pitcher we talk about, but you want to see the bounce back from Luke Holman. He was awesome in his first four starts of the year. And when you look at that Friday night start against Mississippi State, he battled really, really hard without having his best stuff. And the defense let him down plenty in that ball game. You make the plays behind him. That's a much different game between LSU and Mississippi State on Friday night. Ultimately, that's what you want from your guy on Friday. 
give you a chance to win, even if he does not have his best stuff. It's why we've always talked about the pitchability with a guy like Luke Holman. So, obviously, you want him to be more crisp this time. That goes without saying. But one thing you know for sure, he's going to battle his tail off on the mound for you. So, look for a bounce back from Luke Holman. Look for the defense, hopefully, to play better behind him. For Florida, you're looking at sophomore lefty, Cade Fisher uh, for Fisher on the year. This will also be start uh, six appearance number six. He is two and one on the year with a 7.94 ERA in 22 and two thirds innings pitched. He has walked five and struck out 37. The opponent is hitting 295 off of Cade Fisher. Let's talk about Cade Fisher here for a moment. If we could because I think it's real easy to look at those numbers and be like, guy stinks. The guy doesn't stink. Cade Fisher might have the best stuff of anyone in the country that has an ERA just south of eight. And I know you might be like, well, probably plays for Florida, but you're going to see a fastball in the low 90s. It might push to, you know, 94, 95, you're going to see a pretty filthy slider, and he's got a really underrated changeup as well that produces a lot of weak contact because, I mean, that's the point of a changeup. Um, and it all comes from a kind of a, a funky three-quarters arm slot. So the stuff is plenty good. Yes, the numbers themselves, not great, but one thing you can see from that, he's going to be in the zone. He's been hit hard this year. The interesting part and where I where I have pause with a guy like Cade Fisher is his last start's the perfect example of this against Texas A&M. When you look at his last start against A&M, you see a line, six innings, six hits, six earned, one walk, 10 Ks. You just look at that line, not great. You dig a little deeper, he had a great first inning, gave up a five spot in the second, gave up one more run the rest of the way. So he was able to settle in. Now, I understand if LSU go out there and get him early, fine. I don't care if he settles in. You feel, you you, you know, you're hoping Luke Coleman bounces back. And if you jump Cade Fisher early, that's a really, you know, you can hopefully build a cushion and then he settles in. But where I look at him settling in against an SEC lineup is where I say, okay, it's in there. Like, it goes back to what we were saying. Probably the best stuff you'll see out of a guy with an ERA of eight in the entire country. So it's in there for him to kind of settle in and get into a groove. LSU is going to have to really stick to their plan. The 10 strikeouts for him in that game, when he gives up, you know, six earned in six innings, ties a career high with the 10 strikeouts. So there's plenty, plenty in there. Yes, he has struggled. Yes, you want LSU to absolutely take advantage. But while I, all the point I'm trying to get across is he is still plenty, plenty good enough to on any given night, plenty talented enough on any given night, show up with his best stuff to the ballpark and make your life miserable. So we're not going to take, you know, an ADRA for granted. But what I will say is the sample size continues to grow. He continues to get hard, uh, get hit hard. Ooh, he continues to get hit hard and... LSU should have should have success against Cade Fisher on Friday night. Let's move to Saturday for LSU sophomore righty gauge, excuse me, sophomore lefty gauge jump. For jump, you are looking at um you're looking at appearance 6 start 5. He's 2 and 0 on the year with a 2.12 ERA, 17 innings pitched for jump, 5 walks, 24 strikeouts. The opponent hits just 167 off of the Tiger. Lefty, you're looking for a bounce back. Same thing with Luke Holman, right? It was kind of an odd outing for Jump because he started out really strong and then kind of lost the zone a little bit. That's not something we had seen from him really to this point this season. He had really been a guy that, you know, pounded the strike zone constantly, was really all over the wide of the plate. And with, when you have the stuff that he has, uh, that's going to lead to a lot of success, and it has. I mean, if I go back right now and we look through jumps, um, you know, uh, stats game by game here, I see the uh, the three walks 
that he had against Mississippi State, and that is by far the season high. So just get that down, continue to pound the zone. The stuff's plenty good enough, and you would hope to have the bounce back uh, from Gage Jump that I think we're all expecting. I mean, you look at him and Luke Holman, neither of those guys allowed an earned run. Neither of them allowed a, a, a run um, until they got into conference play. So it was really, really, really uh, dominant stuff. You just hope that that continues. For Florida, you're going to see freshman righty Liam Peterson. Peterson on the year, this will be uh, start number six, appearance number six. He is one and two with an ERA of seven and a half, ERA of 18, excuse me, 18 innings pitched, ERA of seven and a half, 18 innings pitched, nine walks. 22 strikeouts. The opponent hits 229 off Peterson. It's obviously big stuff because, I mean, he's a true freshman in a rotation in the SEC for a team that was picked to finish first in the East. Fastball can get up to 96. Got a good breaker. He's just been really, I don't even really want to say inconsistent. He's had a really tough time his last three times out. Um, I mean, pitched... Uh, fine in his season debut against North Florida. Pitched really well against Columbia in his you know first weekend start there. Against Miami, gave up five earned in five innings. Against St. Mary's, gave up four earned in four innings. Against Texas A&M, gave up six earned in two innings. You are looking at 15 earned runs in his last three starts. It is not going great right now for Liam Peterson. Now, we'll throw out the caveat. Super talented guy, but I'm looking at a true freshman making his first road start in the SEC at a place like Alec Box Stadium. That place needs to be jump in, jump in on Saturday night when Liam Peterson takes the mound. And I fully expect it to be jumping, and that'd be a really tough atmosphere for that young man. And I, if I, I look at one game this weekend where I circle it bold it, highlight it, star it, exclamation point, whatever, where I think LSU has the best chance, it's Saturday because of everything that we just went through. A guy who has allowed 15 earned runs in his last three starts, making his first road start in the conference at a place like LSU. That is going to be massive uh, for LSU to jump on him early and often. Let's move to Sunday. For LSU, junior righty, that's Thatcher Hurd. Hurd, appearance five, excuse me, appearance six, start five, one and two on the year, ERA of six and a half, 22 innings pitch, 10 walks, 29 strikeouts. The opponent's hitting 312 off of Thatcher Hurd. Guess what, guys? You'll want to see the bounce back. Hurd had one of the more head scratching outings of the weekend against Mississippi State, where he gave up the three spot in the first inning. That was his worst first inning of the entire year. First time anyone had scored runs against him in the first inning. Then he really looked like he settled in. And it was like, okay, you finally got linked out of some of this. You got five innings out of Hurd. The problem is what happened in the bottom of the fifth when, you know, you, you had the nine hole guy 02, you walk him, and it kind of went off the tracks on him after a long top half by LSU's offense to tie the game. So, you saw glimpses from Hurd of him pitching really, really well. And this is a guy who should have plenty of fond memories facing Florida and facing off against Jack Caglione. That's the last time these two teams met. It was the College World Series National Championship final game. And Thatcher Hurd was awesome for six innings. You need him to channel that and be that guy this weekend. And I think he's capable because, again, like I said, he showed signs Sunday of really settling in and finally got you a little bit of length. It just came off the tracks for him. So uh, we'll be very interested to see um, Hurd get that get that start on Sunday. Let's wrap it up. Junior lefty Jack Caglione for the Gators. Appearance five, start five. He is 2-0 and oh, with an ERA of 1.77 and 20 and a third inning pitch for Cags. 13 walks, 34 strikeouts. The opponent hitting just 132 off of Jack Caglione. We are all very familiar with Jack Caglione. Fastball can get up to 97, 98 from the left side. I mean, it's really good stuff. The thing that everyone watched with him last year was the command and the control. Walks were a big problem for him last season. He looked like early in the year he had that really in check. And I mean, honestly, if you look at it totally from a number standpoint, 13 and 20 and a third, it's not what you you know what you're hoping for there but 
it's still solid. The problem is the last two weeks. In his last two starts, Jack Caglione has walked nine guys total. He had four going into his last two starts. He has walked nine guys total. So if that starts to creep back up again, you have a chance to really put up numbers against him. Now, you look at that start against A&M, he had five walks. That was his season high. He really limited the damage incredibly well, though. Only two runs and only one earned pitching into the sixth inning. So he was able to limit the damage. He walked four against St. Mary's. He didn't give up a run. He didn't give up a hit in that game. So you'll have to see. Now, again, this is different. You're going to be facing LSU on the road, big spot, you know, who knows where the series stands at that point on Sunday. If he's walking, guys, LSU has to take advantage of that because that was his undoing last year whenever he got into trouble, and it looks like that problem has crept back up a little bit here in the last two weeks. So LSU, stick to their plan, drive the pitch count up early, maybe get some free passes, and get him out of the game. Those are your starting pitching matchups with a little thumbnail on all the guys and what we're looking for. Let's dive a little deeper into Florida's team as a whole. A few more guys to look for, uh, to look out for, I should say, uh, on both the mound and offensively. And then we'll give you keys to victory, what we're looking for, and a series prediction. And we will get out of here. Since we just finished the pitching matchups, let's stick with the pitching, shall we? And uh, there's plenty of familiar names uh, for Florida on this team. Uh, you know, out of the bullpen that LSU saw last year. There's also um, there's also some changes, and that's kind of the the thing with this these two teams. There's there's a lot of changes from last year. There's a lot of similarities between them, where you have guys who have kind of you know taken on new roles. Um, I just threw my pin uh, right across the room. Uh, it's fine. I don't really need that. I just kind of like to hold it. Um, I want to split Florida's bullpen up into two different groups. Guys, you know, and then there's this group of freshmen that they really rely on heavily. Uh, Overall, as a staff, Florida has an ERA of 5.78. That is 14th in the SEC. Dead last. Not something you're used to seeing from a Kevin uh, O'Sullivan-coached team. But that is where Florida sits. Now, what I will say, you've probably heard plenty of people tell you the bullpen has been a struggle this year. It has but there's a few signs that make me think they're kind of starting to turn the corner a little bit there, so really keep an eye. Let's talk about the uh, the veterans that we all know, and you're going to start with Brandon Neely, right-handed closer, SE, reigning SEC and National Pitcher of the Week. Six shutout innings, a save, and a win to go along with 10 strikeouts in the last week of work for uh, for Brandon Neely. Three-quarter arm slot from the right side. Fastball up to 96. A pretty filthy slider to go along with it. He's made nine appearances so far. That's third on the team. Uh, And he's got an ERA just north of five. But he's one of those guys who's starting to round into form. And we just told you, National Pitcher of the Week, in his last three outings, he has not given up an earned run. So he's been really, really good. He's a guy that can use multiple times in the weekend. He's he's lethal in the back end of Florida's bullpen. Ryan Slater, guy you should be very familiar with. LSU saw him in the College World Series Finals last season. He leads the team with 11 appearances and has an ERA of 3.74. His best pitch is a nasty, nasty slider. He leans on that slider. Fastball can get to the low 90s, but again, the slider is the pitch to watch um, when you're talking Ryan Slater, and they've counted on him an awful lot. Again, 11 appearances to lead this team. He's totaled 21 and two-thirds innings in those, so it's 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 long relief. It's short relief. They can use him in a multitude of different ways, and they really, really count on him uh, plenty. Blake Purnell is another name that should be very familiar to, uh, to many of you. LSU's seen him multiple times. A real veteran arm. Off to a slow start this year, but he's the sidearm, just like true sidearm guy. It's an ERA north of eight, but it hasn't stopped him from putting him in the game. Nine any, no, excuse me, nine appearances, but it's mainly in matchup roles uh, in, a, in a sense, and just because some of the time with that ERA, obviously it hasn't gone well for him, so they've had to have a quick hook, but it has not, again, it has not stopped them from putting him into 
the ball game. All right, let's talk about this core of freshmen that Florida has now in their bullpen that they've leaned heavily on. We will start with Fisher Jamison. Ten appearances, that is second on the team. True freshman righty uh, is Jamison. Uh, oh, excuse me, he's a junior. He's he's a junior. Uh, I actually meant to throw him in the in the veteran category. You just haven't seen a lot of him. He's one of those guys that's kind of taking on a bit of a new role, uh, and they've used him plenty, 10 appearances, really o- like straight over-the-top delivery, fastball getting to the low 90s, but that over-the-top delivery it creates a lot of tilt, especially on the breaking ball. It, it can be really, really nasty at times, and he's performed well in those 10 appearances in ERA just north of four. Uh, more strikeouts than innings pitched, a low batting average against. He's been very, very good. My, my apologies for that. Now to the freshman, and uh, we will start with uh, freshman righty Alex Philpot. Ten appearances, tying him with Fisher on the team. An ERA of four and a half, another low 90s fastball, another nice breaking ball, uh, a guy that they've used long, uh, you know, for longer outings, a guy that they've used for shorter outings. You look at a guy like Alex Philpot, longest outing on the year, three innings on three separate occasions, Shortest outing of the year, um, well, shortest out on the year where he recorded an out is uh, an inning and a third. That was against St. Mary. So there's been some rough outings for him. He got off to a great start. It's been a little bit rougher for him as of late. Um, he's given up at least one earned run in his last one, two, three, four, five, six appearances. Uh, but again, hasn't stopped them from using him. They're really high on that young, talented freshman. Freshman lefty, um, Robert Satin, eight appearances on the year, eight and a third innings. You might think okay, he's an inning, you know, per outing guy. Not necessarily true. He is also has a three-inning start, excuse me, a three-inning outing um, under his belt for his season long. But, yeah, there has been a, some matchup there uh, with him. It's kind of a funky three-quarters delivery from the left side. He's not an overly big guy. He's not going to burn, you know, burn it up uh, fastball wise, but it's a lot of good stuff with movement. Like remember how we talked about Evan Sierra when we previewed the Mississippi state series, everything moves. Same thing here with, uh, with, with uh, satin, everything moves uh, for him. Then there's freshman right-hander Grayson Smith. He is kind of a uh, right-handed version of satin uh, Smith. Eight appearances, 10 and two-thirds. So, again, multiple different ways they can use him. Fastball will really kind of top out probably 92, 93. But he's got a nice splitter. Really leans on the splitter. Not a pitch you see often in college baseball. He has one. And uh, if he has that pitch going, he can be really, really, really tough. All of those guys we just went through have an ERA in the fours, except for Satin, who's at 1.08. One more freshman. One more freshman to talk about. And that is Luke McNeely. Luke McNeely's a freshman righty. Good stuff. Florida likes to use him in multiple roles. We've seen him at the back end of the bullpen. You've seen him kind of middle relief as well. ERA is elevated, but he seems to be finally turning the corner. Kind of the same thing when you look at Brandon Neely. McNeely got off to a really tough start in his first four outings. He had given up 14 earned runs. In his last three, he's given up two. And in his last two outings, he has thrown shutout ball, including a save against Texas A&M in the the rubber match of that series and two and a third dominant innings against Jacksonville in the midweek where he struck out six. So that is a guy, again, yes, elevated ERA. It has not stopped them from using him. And he has uh, really looked like he's starting to turn the corner. And if he is, that's going to help Florida's bullpen tremendously. So you have your your uh, core group of veterans with Slater, Neely, Jamison, and Purnell, and you have this core group of freshmen that they're using a lot with Satin, um, Smith, Philpot, and McNeely. So those are really the guys to keep an eye on. Again, some of them are pitching much better as of late, so the Florida bullpen issue might not be as extreme as, uh, you know, as we might be made to believe. Now, What is as extreme as you are made to believe is the threat that Florida's offense poses. My goodness, what a lineup Kevin O'Sullivan has himself down there in Gainesville. We're going to start with Jack Caglione because I don't really know where else 
you start. Jay Johnson, when he met with the media on Thursday, was asked what makes Jack Caglione so tough at the plate. Bat speed and um, he's aggressive. Uh, I feel like he knows what his pitch is and he's, he's, he's going when he gets it. You know, I think guys that can really pull the ball with, with power and authority and drive it and consistently hit mistakes. Like there's a reason like he's pushed up there to a top, a lot of top draft boards. And he's obviously, you know, equally talented on the mound, but he's really good. He's hitting 414. That obviously leads Florida. Uh, nine home runs. That's second on their team. 21 RBI. That is third on the team, but he has been awesome at the plate and you're going to have to circle number 14 in the lineup and nowhere, you know, know when he's due up at all times. That is a guy who can wreck your day, wreck your weekend in a hurry. I mean, in a hurry. I don't have to tell you. Y'all know that. I don't, he's, he's something else. Um, when, when I, I go down the list here, Tyler Shelnut has been on an absolute heater for Florida. Shelnut, uh, I mean, you look at his numbers overall, he's hitting 329. He's got seven homers. He leads the team in RBI, which shouldn't be surprising because he hits 409 with runners in scoring position. You look just at his last six games, and I'll say this slowly because I know we throw a lot of numbers out there sometimes at you on, on this show, and numbers don't always translate great. So this is this is, uh, this is is Tyler Shelnut's last six games. 440, three homers, five doubles, nine RBI. That guy is scorching hot coming into Baton Rouge. So circle, bold, Tyler Shelnut in the lineup. He can also ruin your day and your weekend in a hurry. Colby Shelton. We went through Shelnut, Kegler. We've gone through two guys, and we haven't even gotten to Colby Shelton yet. He was the first guy we mentioned when we previewed Alabama last year. Yeah, it's that guy who hit like 25 homers as a freshman at Alabama and played first base. Now he's transferred to Florida. He's playing shortstop, and he leads them with 10 homers. Is second on the team with 22 RBI. He has been a spark plug and a huge bat in the middle of their lineup, as you should expect. Ty Evans, who was awesome in the College World Series last year, is off to a great start this year at 360 for Florida. You look at uh, Cade Curlin. Remember him? He had leadoff for this team last year. He's at 308. Luke Heyman's right there at 288. This is a lethal, lethal lineup. And where they make their hay is with the long ball. That shouldn't be surprising. 44 home runs for Florida this season, number eight nationally, number three in the Southeastern Conference. So we'll talk about that a little bit when we get to keys to victory and things to watch. But that's where Florida really, really, really makes their hay is home runs and doubles. And uh, they've been great at it all season long. 298, the cumulative team batting average for um, for Florida. Oh, see, I, I passed this over in my notes. Cade Curlin. Uh, carries the longest hitting streak for Florida right now at nine games. So keep that in mind as well. Okay, that's a lot, I know. But let's talk about keys to victory, what we're watching for this weekend, and ultimately series prediction, and we'll get you out of here. Um, smash the like button if you haven't already. Get subscribed to the YouTube channel and on your favorite podcast app. All of that, greatly appreciated. For LSU, let's start on the mound. I want to see LSU finish guys off better. LSU did not finish hitters off well against Mississippi State. They did finish off hitters much better against La Tech, who was a veteran lineup and a, a really good test for them. This is a whole nother animal. This is, without question, the best lineup LSU has faced all season to this point. It might be the best lineup LSU will face all season. And it's coming off of a week where you were dreadful. Finish off hitters better. We played the cut on a previous episode this week about Jay Johnson talking about them throwing with more conviction and him saying the right pitch isn't better than the wrong pitch if you're throwing the wrong pitch with conviction attack 
that's what I want to see. You come at this Florida lineup timid in any way, and you're going to have a really, really long weekend. Now, that being said, I think the message has sunk in. I think they've heard what Jay Johnson, what Nate Yeski, what all those guys have preached to them since Monday when they got back from Starkville or Sunday night when they got back from Starkville. So I think they're ready. I think they want to get out there. They want to pitch. They want to get the bad taste out of their mouth. But finish. Finish guys off when you have the opportunity. Keep Florida in the ballpark. This could be a great weekend to pitch at Alec Box State. Friday night, it's probably going to be a little wet. The wind's going to be blowing in from the north. Those are not going to be favorable offensive conditions. You have been the better pitching staff so far this season compared to Florida. That's not debatable. You're both equally as talented. You have executed better than them. And again, it's a day where the wind can be blowing in. LSU has given up the second least, second least amount of home runs in the Southeastern Conference. That's going to be put to the test this weekend against Florida. But again, the conditions could be favorable uh, to keep them in the park. You look at Saturday, same thing. It's going to be a little chilly Saturday night. The wind is going to be coming in from the north yet again at the box. Sunday, the wind shifts and starts blowing out. But hopefully you take care of business and you're just playing for a sweep. That's something to watch. Just, you know, bold, underlined star. Can LSU continue to keep teams in the ballpark because this is going to be their biggest test they've had of that. Field the baseball behind your pitchers. LSU has committed nine errors in their last four games, and that is bad especially when you compare them to a team like Florida, who is not going to give you anything in the field. Florida is the number one fielding team nationally. Let me say that again. Florida is the best fielding team in the country at 986. That is so, so, so elite. So they're probably not going to give you anything. You can't give them anything either. And if they do give you something, you damn sure better make, uh, you better make damn sure that run scores. Take advantage of it if they give you anything. Offensively for LSU, keep that trajectory. I can't wait to see the lineup uh, Friday night. I'm very, very excited to see who all they have in there. I mean, I think, you know, Pearson's going to be in there. He's, he's hot right now. Tommy White, can he stay hot? That's what I want to see. Last last week, it was can the guys who started to get hot, can they stay hot through the first SEC weekend? They did. Tommy White, Josh Pearson, Michael Braswell, they did. This week, can the guys who were hot before SEC play find it again? Steven Milam, Brady Neal, you know, Guys like that, Mac Bingham, can they find it again and just lengthen this LSU lineup? Because if those three guys we just mentioned start to really hit and Pearson stays hot and Braswell stays hot and Tommy Tanks keeps doing his thing, this lineup just got really, really long, really, really fast. And when you're facing a pitching staff that has had their problems, plenty talented, but has had their problems, that's going to be huge. All seven road teams in the SEC lost last weekend. Jay Johnson has talked plenty this week leading into this series about the first road test giving LSU problems, the atmosphere giving LSU problems. Well, when we just went through Florida's pitching, we named a lot of freshmen that they count on heavily make life difficult for those freshmen in their first road action in the SEC in one of the nation's best environments. Do to them what was done to you in Starkville. You do that, you have a chance to have a lot of success. Jump on the first two starters. I threw a lot of bouquets at Cade Fisher for a guy who has an ERA of eight. Make him look like the guy who has an ERA of eight, not the guy I threw bouquets at. 
Liam Peterson's a freshman. Make him look like a freshman in his first road start. LSU should be able to win the first two games of this series, provided they go out and execute. The conditions are favorable to pitching. That should check a box for LSU. And you have a sophomore and a freshman starting on the mound for the opposition. I like LSU to bounce back this weekend. I'll take the Tigers two out of three. Not calling for a sweep, but I'll take the Tigers two out of three. If I had to pick it, I'd say they probably win game one and game two and drop game number three. But we will see. But I'm on record. LSU bounces back this weekend, and they take the series at home from Florida. You know we're going to have a full recap for you. We'll have some live reactions after the game and a full recap to follow uh, when the weekend concludes. So stay tuned, stay locked right here, and join me next time on Musso at the Box.